today. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience right now, but we have today an amazing panel on trade and gender. My name is Laura Montesioca, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. I'm very pleased to have with us great speakers. Uh, they're professionals of the private, public, and academia sectors. Today, this will allow us to have this uh, multidisciplinary so perspective right now, uh, in this session. We are all co-founders of Trade Tank MX. Uh, very quickly, Trade Tank is a think tank originated in Mexico. We are very passionate about trade. We want to broaden the, the in understanding of international trade dynamics in Mexico and the world and probably uh, have an effect on the trade policies. So we also want to thank our colleagues in Trade Tank. Let me first introduce you, Alcira Gomez, very quickly. Alcira, she's an economist and specializes in international trade matters. She is currently uh, in the private sector as a foreign trade chief at Alpha, a Mexican conglomerate with a global presence. She is also a president of Trade Tank MX. Thank you very Thank much, you. Laura. Thank you to the team in Trade Tank, all men and, and, and women who help us to be here today. Um, hello. Thank you, Alcira. We also have with us Isadora Lopez. She is a trade analyst. She works in the Ministry of Economy. Uh, she should support the action and the monitoring in national trade in service and invest I have hello Lara thanks for having me thank you Geneva Trade platform for this initiative um well let's uh, enroll in this discussion thank you and finally we have uh, well Nata Sili, she has worked for almost a decade in academia in global affairs and the political economy of the American. Currently, she studies her second master's degree in international economy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. Thank you, Laura. I think it's, we cannot hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here with you and looking forward for a great discussion. And finally, we have Vanessa Camarillo. She's a lawyer and uh, with expertise in international trade matters. She has worked for the Ministry of Economy and she's currently an associate at the law firm Dorantes Advisors. Good to see you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Geneva Trade Week for the opportunity to be here. So, I will start with the format of the discussion. I'll kick off the conversation with a question to you. I will try to minute the video to introduce our session. Then our panelists are going to discuss very briefly uh, what are some of the most present challenges for women. We focused on four of them. We know there are a lot, but after this, we will proceed with the more interactive part of our discussions. First, we will use Padlet. Padlet is a tool where you will see four columns represented each uh, of, the, of the challenge that each panelist is going to discuss. So for you to actually uh, participate, you're going to write simultaneously with other participants your ideas and how to how we can bridge this this issue. We are going to explain it later, but I just wanted to for you to visualize it. So your participation is important because it's going to help us and the panelists to broaden the discussion. After the activity ends, the panelists are going to give their final remarks and finally we are going to have another activity related to other uh, word clouds so you can see what are the takeaways that you that you get from from this so let's start our first question for you is do you think gender should be a cross-cutting consideration in this I don't know. Can you, Antonio, please 
the poll or is it going to be more uh, uh, from WebEx? I don't know if you can see it. We wanted to ask you this because this is something that the officials have been asking for. So, maybe we're not seeing, right? No, we're so not having I think a This is more, oh, okay, perfect. So, I can say to you that by 2020, we can say that this is really a cross-cutting issue in the WTO. Effectively, this has been a very different answer some years back. So I think we should all thank all the trade analysts, the activists, and everyone who enhanced this problem as being part of the trade agenda. So we have good news. Just last week, there was the creation of an informal group on trade and gender inside the WTO to deepen these trade and gender discussions, which is a very important step so we're going to analyze right now and comprehend why this event marks a very, very good step. We are now going to present to you a video of Vanessa Erogbobo. She is the Chief of the Sustainable and Inclusive Value Chain Section at ITC and of the She Trades Initiative going to what is the Buenos Aires Declaration and why is it important. So, I give the video. Hello, my name is Vanessa Erobobo. I'm the Chief of the Sustainable and Inclusive Value Chain Section at ITC and the head of the She Trades Initiative. Now, the Buenos Aires Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment, adopted at the 11th World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference in 2017, is a collective initiative to unleash the full potential of women in trade. It was spearheaded by the International Gender Champions Trade Impact Group, which is co-chaired by Botswana, by Iceland, and by the International Trade Center. Today, 127 WTO members support this initiative. But why was this declaration so important? Well, first, uh, for the first time, Gender was placed at the heart of the multilateral trade agenda. Second, we set ourselves a really comprehensive agenda. The Trade Impact Group has shared good practices and advanced recommendations on key themes, such as collecting and analyzing uh, gender data, public procurement, global value chains, financial inclusion, free trade agreements. The findings of these discussions will be found in a publication produced by the Trade Impact Group to guide policymakers. And third, governments and international organizations have developed specific tools and guidance on how to turn these commitments on trade and gender into reality. That includes ITC's own She Trades Outlook, a trade and gender policy online tool which is already available for 25 countries and going global. This has been a massive step, but it's also the beginning of a much longer journey. So thank you. The, we first we will thank Vanessa for her time to give us an extraordinary introduction to our session. And I agree with her. This is the beginning of a much longer journey. Three years have passed since the declaration was adopted, and it is time for us to reflect on it and the road ahead. We are moving in the right direction, as you can see with Vanessa but we are not doing it at the right speed. According to the World Economic Forum, global gender parity will take 99.5 years 
This means that a 10-year-old today will probably not experience gender parity during her working life, even in her life. So particularly regarding access and opportunities from international trade, especially with the global pandemic, this only increases the relevance to talk about gender and and, and trade. So WTO members and stakeholders, we realize that they can and must do more. And the question we have is, what are some promising ways that we can incorporate gender into the WTO's work? We also realize that WTO members and face several challenges in tackling women's economic empowerment. There are many of them, but in uh, as I said, we are going to discuss four. I'm going to say to you the, our, the challenge one, which is the lack of education technology. The challenge two would be higher tariffs and non-tariff measures burdens. And the challenge three would be labor market and business. And the challenge four is the COVID-19 and the gender disaggregated data explained by our panelists. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Al Give us the overview on how women are affected by the lack of education and access of technologies and in what way the policymakers link it to trade. Alcida, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Laura. It's kind of ironic to speak about technology after this bumpy beginning, but we are more than happy to have this space to discuss such an important to topic. And I would like to begin with the obvious. Policymakers have the responsibility to assess the potential impact of trade rules on various groups of people, including women, of course. Regarding trade policy, it is evident that, in a way, it has been unintentionally biased against women. Although no country imposes direct tariffs to gender, there are real implicit biases that affect women differently. For example, mobile internet, a tool that is widely used to buy and sell goods and services locally and internationally. The 2019 Mobile Gender Gap Report from GSMA, an organization that represents mobile operators worldwide, shows that mobiles are the primary means of internet access, and on average, women are 23% less likely than men to use it. The same organization reported in 2015 that in China and Mexico, harassment is among the top barriers in owning and using a mobile phone. So when your sex is a barrier to access, a tool that will get you to buy and sell something, it becomes a matter of trade too. Another example is how UNESCO reports that still more girls than boys remain out of school and two thirds of women adults have no basic literacy skills. Visualize it as the production function you may have seen in your Econ 01 class, the Cobb Douglas's function, that includes human capital and technology as factors of production. To the extent that these factors, say access to education and technology, do not represent optimal contributions on half of the population, us women, then the productivity will be below its possibilities. The acknowledgement of this relation is thank thankfully one tangible thing that we take from the Joint Declaration on Trade and Women Economic Empowerment on the occasion of the WTO Buenos Aires Ministerial Conference. It is a step that policymakers should not take back. Acknowledging and improving women's access to opportunities, removing barriers to their participation in national and international economy, contribute to better international trade and investment as economic growth engines for all countries. To finish this intervention, I'll say that access to education and technologies help bypass the trade barriers faced by women just because they are women. Also in the end, trade liberalization is also linked to greater accumulation of education and skills at the time that increases gender equality. Actually, one recent publication from the World Bank and the WTO called Women and Trade, the Role of Trade in Promoting Women's Equality, calls this relation a virtuous cycle. 
it's a win-win situation. Thank you, Alcira. Definitely, it's a it's a win-win situation uh, that countries also have to take into account, uh, especially because key for women to to give the skills to this size existing. It is to continue discussing this. And with regards to the opportunities that trade liberalization has, I will pass it to you, Isadora, for you to explain us what are some challenges that women-owned companies have re, uh, in comparison with men and during this can you have the floor thank you Laura. thank you for the floor well let me begin saying that well men and women face trade barriers but these are higher for women due to legal and cultural constraints. This uh, argument is supported by evidence uh, on World Bank uh, study, 2016, Women, Business and Law. It surveyed uh, 173 countries, and out of this, 90% uh, stated that they found at least one impeding law in terms of access of opportunities to women. Well, this fact is totally striking. And also we can go further into more specific sectors saying that more than 50% of female owned businesses are concentrated in sectors with high, with high barriers to cross-border trading services and goods. What can, do we mean with that? Um, we have women specialized in uh, goods in terms of food, drinks, and textile. And also in terms of services, we have uh, women involved in retail, in transportation, and construction. So these sectors are related with the administration of measures, with granting of permits and licenses. So these are, these are barriers that can be removed within the scope of WTO, or at least uh, having a more um, transparent scope of what are the procedures. In these terms, also uh, just to highlight that, well, more other measures are addressed in domestic agendas, but the aim of this session would be to highlight the importance of beginning this discussion here in the international arena, and how can we proceed to uh, enhance the the, the willingness of the members to actually do something more about it and just uh, improve measures and to see which other disciplines can be taken care of in this term. Yeah, and especially uh, in this context of the working group uh, in trade and gender and plurilateral initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Isadora. Definitely, we have to continue discussing this issue, and I think this is one of our motivations with, uh, regarding this panel, because we wanted to highlight how we have all to work together, whether it's multilateral or governments, national. So we have also to recognize that women ha have more legal and regulatory barriers to women. So next, I will invite to join Vanessa, and linking it to what Isadora said, we are seeing this uh, barriers, but we are also seeing that disadvantage in the in the job conditions of women. Can you explain us more? Yes, Laura. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, here, I need to say that the core issue in this matter is that women have to face several issues in labor. Women are less likely to participate in lab labor market than men around the world because many factors affect female labor force participation. Women are more likely to be unemployed than men. In 2017, global unemployment rates for men and women stood at 5.5% and 6.2% respectively. It was considered that this could remain relatively unchanged for 2021. But in the light of the effects of COVID-19, uh, these rates will change considerably. Uh, my colleague Renata will discuss further in this matter. I need to add the gender wage gap is estimated to be 23%. This means that women earn 77% less than men. So these figures understand the real extent of gender pay gap, particularly in developing countries where informal self-employment is prevalent. 
it is estimated that gender gaps cost to the economy zone of 15% uh, of GDP. For example, the main factors that are determinants of female labor force participation are related to religion, to cultural and social norms, access to education, income level, fertility, institutions, uh, here in institutions, we need to include legal framework, enterprises, labor union, and others. Uh, other factors are sectoral base uh, of the economy. We have to consider agricultural, industrial, and service base. We have to face other um, factors like political regimes, and in some countries, war and conflicts. These are only some of the issues of the many that women have to face around the world. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Vanessa. It is definitely a crucial issue to understand that first women are having 23% of gender wage gap, which is unfortunately, but also we can see that women are having very much lar larger rate of unemployment, which is even worse uh, having this pandemic. So with that, uh, Renata, I think Isadora, Vanessa, and Alcia are giving this scope, but we are seeing that actually COVID-19 has enhanced or has put into the spotlight the inequality. So we wanted, I want to ask you to to expand on that and to also relate to what, how can gender data or gender disaggregated data help? Thank you, Laura. Well, as we have learned today from Vanessa Aerogobo, one of the core aims from the Buenos Aires Declaration is the importance in the analysis and recollection of gender data. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if this was already a pressing issue before COVID, the current evidence reveals that the pandemic is hitting women even harder. Even in the largest economies like the United States, the unemployment rate remains larger and bigger for women than men. This issue places women from all over the world at a higher risk due to the consequences of the economic shocks and trade disruptions that the pandemic is generating. And while many experts agree that increasing women's participation in the labor force could be a key determinant for the post-pandemic economic recovery, there is still a lack of consent on a specific efforts on how to address that challenge. But that's why we kind of are here for. But then what I want you to take from this session today is to start bearing in mind that there might be other constraints from women's full inclusion in the economy that might not be strictly related and reflected as economic indicators. Next slide, please. So, Gender disaggregated data must be seen as an opportunity to understand our world more accurately. And the pandemic has been a great example for what I intend to say. From looking at this chart on your right, evidence seems to suggest that the virus affects differently women than men. So it makes totally sense to examine which could be the potential underlying causes, whether they are biological, social, both, or something else. But in order to do so, we previously had had to have this disaggregation of data. But then what are we aiming with this? At least for the public sector, once you have identified the issue, the next step is policymaking. And I would like to illustrate this issue with a brief example. It is quite obvious that sanitary pads and tampons are a product purchased by women. Globally, more than 1.2 billion women lack access to basic sanitation and hygiene, which can cause them to be absent from their economic activities during menstruation. Hence, to identify these specific needs, you need a gender approach which could help and enable countries to create policies that either eliminate additional costs, as, such as imposed tariffs, as you are looking on the slide, or even given the inelasticity of these goods, prevent the imposition of additional taxes. Well, this example might be quite obvious, but there are many others that might not be so. Why is this important in the lens of trade? Well, mainly, I, for two reasons I want to give you two in this session. 
First, we need to broaden our understanding and assimilate why these seemingly trivial issues fall in the scope of trade. That's the first thing. Because although they might not be strictly causal, that doesn't deny their correlation. But to prove that, we need data. And second, it is essential that we challenge our perception that gender neutral is in fact neutral. And I would like to think, I would like you to think to what extent the male-dominated public life for the past years created unintentional biases in designing cities, products, taxes, or even international laws. And I want to be clear that I don't think this happened necessarily for nefarious purposes. But what I'm saying is that in order to achieve greater gender equity, perhaps we should ha start having the conversation that we have differences that may have not been taken into account originally. And maybe neutral might not be entirely neutral, and perhaps there is an intentional neutrality skewed towards men. But to prove that and address those glitches, we need data and a good narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Uh, definitely is something that we need to keep it, especially given that women are more at risk. So I think to recap, you have talked about relevance that women face that impedes them to participate in trade for the fact of education, because information, everything is power. So a lack of access of education and, and technology impedes them to, to have these skills. And if and if governments are not involved, we it's very difficult to get this trade gender equality. So second, we have trade barriers that impede equality for women to trade, as, as we heard from Isadora. And third, we even if trade improves lives, it can also do job losses and concentration. I will also add to, to low skill employment that face or urgent wage gap. So perspectives of COVID and the vulnerability of women, we have to have gender disagreement. So the next is be part and the interactive one. We encourage you to follow this QR code and also this link. Uh, you're going to see maybe in the chat, we're going to put some uh, the link in the for the ones in WebEx and for the ones that are online in YouTube or Vimeo, you can QR for you to to follow up on this uh, discussion, we are going to think together about do you think that we can overcome this challenge? And also, what are your experience maybe on where you live, where you work? We also encourage the ones that are in WebEx, whether you want to take the floor, you can also raise your hand or or take the floor. I think you. It is possible. Also by chat, we will also be uh, very. Uh, um, we, we will very tuning in if you if you already mentioned something. So while you think about it, I will give the floor to Alcira. So if you want something first. Sure. Sure. Well, of course, uh, maybe it's a good time to watch the public. Exactly. Well, this is, it's very important to ask ourselves and everyone involved in the conversation. How do we think women in trade uh, life has, is, has become a challenge? How do we see it in, our, in the place where we work or where we live? Do we have any cases of, that sound familiar? I may not personally have a particular case regarding trade, but I can see that how emergency technology can be turned from a threat to an opportunity for women with the correct cooperation between governments and stakeholders. 
For example, in 2017, a study from a recruiting startup called Apply or Apply found out that only nine of the 109 tech startups in Mexico had a woman as CEO, and only 20% of them had a woman among their co-founders. Yet, some actions have been taken and need to continue to be taken, like the OECD initiative called the Niñas STEM Pueden for Mexico, which means girls STEM can. And this is a gender network to promote, help, and incentivize women to pursue STEM professionalization. So actually, this is why I believe that affirmative actions help. Affirmative action is the, the policy practice of favoring individuals belonging to groups known that have been discriminated against previously such as the seeking of job positions in equal dis distribution, also known as parity, or granting certain incentives or scholarships for women. So when we face this disparity, we cannot hold on to the may the best win, just because there are some who have not had the chance to reach the minimum essential in accordance to their human rights. Um, so yes, I think affirmative actions are important, and actually, as a result, result of this STEM Girls program I was telling you about, one good example is that among the G20 economies, economies from 2010 and 2015, India, Mexico, and Turkey reported the highest shares of patents invented by women. Also, Mexico has published the Ley General para la Igualdad entre Mujeres y Hombres, which is the general law for equality between women and men. So at state, at state level, we recognize gender equality. Um, in conclusion, there is proven evidence that show that in lower income countries where gender gap in education and labor market are higher, the potential for innovation and investment decreases. So we know that it's not the way to go. The, the way we need to go is the opposite, to address these in incentives and do better for women in trade. Thank you, Alcida. Um, maybe, Sadora, can you, can you tell us a little bit about your, what, what is your perspective? Well, uh, my perspective of bridging this issue into the WTO scope um, is, uh, well, in my, my personal view, I deal with the four modes of supply. So I'm um, really used to, to dealing with measures that sometimes can be discriminatory. And as stated before, you can also classify them and that some are attributed to cultural um, um, some sort of factors, cultural, um, some religious, educational factors that are more intrinsic to each member, to each nation. So these are harder to tackle. But uh, going forward to some measures that are related to to the granting or to the facilitation of providing these services would be a, a good way to go to have a um, best practices in regulatory measures that would allow members to at least uh, make forward a better development in the sector that were highly regulated. Well, as examples, um, for example, uh, we can see that cross-border trading services is related to e-commerce is the main um, is the main source of this uh, border um, non non-resident transactions. So in this case. I see that there is a big uh, lack of education and adoption of this method of business that could be improved by some uh, initiatives mentioned in WTO. Also, as another example, I see bans in traveling that uh, women need permits of the husband to actually uh, have this um, to do so, to, to, to actually travel, no matter which purposes. In terms of uh, establishment, they need permits, they need uh, licenses. So in terms of also in providing services abroad, they need some uh, 
criteria and qualification uh, related. So in these terms, we have uh, certain initiatives in WTO that can help. I'm not saying that is a, is a panacea, that it's going to help us all to, to remove all non tariff uh, barriers, but still it's a good way to actually learn from other members' best practices. And in this case, it's establishment of the working group in WTO that has the aim of sharing with other members uh, measures and policies that have succeeded. And in this case, we have Canada that has a global comprehensive framework that is status the, the gender approach and it touches as well uh, trade. So in this case, we see that we have a lot to learn and we can uh, have baby steps with uh, ameliorating some measures in terms of administration that can be improved. So in this case, I applaud and I see a bridging alternative in a WTO working group and a plurilateral initiatives that are related to e-commerce, to investment facilitation and to domestic regulation to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Vani. Do you have any comments? Um, yes, Laura. Uh, regarding what uh, Isadora was saying, uh, women's economy empowerment is central to realizing women's rights and gender equality. This includes women's ability to participate equally in existing markets, the, um, their access to and control over productive resources, access to decent work, control over their own time, lives, and bodies and increased voice, agency, and meaningful participation in economy decisions making at all levels from the household to international institutions. As Isadora was saying, gender differences in laws affect both developing and developed economies and women in all the regions. Globally, over 2.7 billion women are legally restricted from having the same choice of jobs as men. Uh, of 1890 uh, economies assessed in 2018, 104 economies still have laws preventing women from working in specific jobs. In 59 economies have no laws on sexual harassment in the workplace. And in 18 economies, husbands can still legally prevent their wives from working. We need to change that, this panorama and increase the opportunities for women to participate in labor force. Evidence shows that trade can help women uh, to move into the formal economy and prevent some of the issues that I have already explained. As people is responding in the Padlet, it's the, uh, because of discrimination, it's because of discrimination and all these factors that I am mentioning. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Vane. Renata? Yes, thank you. I have answered a couple of questions uh, in, in, in the Padlet, and I invite you to look at the link of the, of the data tracker uh, later for your own purposes, like, and to see how other relevant initiatives that have been, that are in place. Uh, but for, of course, like, what are, according to, to my perspective, which are the main challenges? Well, I think in general terms, there could be said that there could be two big challenges. First of all, resources, and second, international cooperation. Countries need different types of resources, like physical, technological, which is the capital or the K, borrowing the same example from a serious production function. Then the human capital, that is labor. But in this specific case, think about the labor requirements and the level of education and skills needed to collect and interpret big data. And well, the, the, the third element for, at least for some economic growth models, is the knowledge or the ideas factor. But the only way in which countries, specifically the small ones, could expand their possibilities frontier in terms of capital educated workers, both mostly on new ideas, which also can be read as science and development and technology, is through trade and international cooperation. And, and I'm sorry, 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 uh, there, there's another question there. And yeah, well, indeed, uh, the data economy provides many opportunities. 
but the crucial, and, and I know like technology has been a double razor blade, but also one most thing that technology has always been the engine of progress for our civilization. As I was mentioning earlier, one of the advantages that the data economy provides is to understand our world more accurately. The higher level of detail, the more resources to understand a particular phenomenon tends to understand our world. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Renata. I'm seeing some questions right now in Padlet. I don't know also yes, yes. if any of the of the attendees will want to, to participate or as well anyone that that want to 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 get into the into the discussion, please do so. Yeah, actually, yeah. Laura, I'm seeing here some interesting questions about uh, how the relation uh, between the trade dispute between China and the U.S. put some constraints on on products, and also another one about sustainability and MSMEs, um, medium and small enterprises. First. What I first want to say is that, well, I put there the, the link to the, the special group launched by the WTO to boost women participation in trade that also Isadora was telling us about. But I think it's important to, to say that the aspects of sustainability, medium enterprises and gender do not have to wait until the trade wars get resolved. I mean, we're living in this world and it's ticking and the time is going, and these are problematics that have to be addressed now. So in terms of, of what we can do, we have, to pick, we have to follow on these topics. We have to engage more and more countries into the correct uh, path to go in the scope of the of the multilateral trading system. And we have to keep sharing these spaces and this conversation because we know what is right. A sustainable world is right. A fair world is right. A world with human rights, it's okay. So we know where to go and we, we need to keep talking on this. Thank you. Thank you. Isa, any comments? Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, sorry, for, sorry for interrupting you. Um, I would like to take a question from the Padlet. And it, it's a really good question. It says how the rules and regulation will work toward the new currency, which is big data um, and information, meaning Facebook, Instagram, WeChat, TikTok. Will it define the exports and imports for the services? How do you see that coming in the WTO? Well, um, okay, you see me? Okay, um, so it's a really re relevant question because um, actually cross-border trading services has the, in terms of the four modes, is the one with the least restrictions in terms of non-tariff uh, measures or regulations, because you don't need to get established. You don't need to travel to other country to, to get that, ser that service. You don't need to, to you don't need to have this movement or this present interaction. And right now with COVID times, it has been really relevant. And we have seen a lot of push in this industry regarding the current context. We have been in uh, online shopping, we have uh, purchased um, books, uh, videos, we have uh, used the streaming apps. So all of this is encompassed and can be compiled into um, provisions on e-commerce that are mainly related to digital products. So in WTO, since, uh, well, since a long time, we have the moratorium that is uh, reducing and eliminating the custom duties. That means that you don't have to pay any duty, any amount of money due to this transaction, to this uh, electronic transaction. Um, in this case, uh, the moratorium uh, provision has been replaced, has been um, 
duplicated into other agreements such as USMCA and other agreements that Mexico has, but it's really standard. So, um, um, well, the thing in WTO future, what do we see um, since, it's, since the world is a moratorium and it should have an end, but it hasn't been so far, we could um, just uh, follow up, maybe have a, another different um, provision that it's more relevant, that it's permanent. And where can we fit in? We can fit in in the e-commerce joint um, um, initiative on the works on that, on the text currently negotiated, ongoing negotiated. And uh, also in within this initiative, we can also use and push some cooperations uh, activities that would try to include women into this sector. That as Alcira said, we have some uh, educational and uh, we have also impossibilities, we have trouble getting access into internet, but uh, at least there are some key issues that could be worked on to actually include women in the sector. So the future of um, all this sector, it's uh, by women and within this initiative. Thank you. I, I think we have a question right now. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, why this panel is making emphasis on the unintended when referring to the consequences of this? Isn't it true that many consequences were not unintended had a goal, the exclusion of groups of people for, for women? Uh, I would invite maybe to, for, uh, for, for the one that we write it, if, if you can contribute, maybe we want to hear you as well. And maybe any panelists, if you want to comment on, on this. Uh... Yeah, I would jump into the conversation, like to, to jump the answer, like to answer. And um, for, for sure, like I understand that we've been saying that it's unintentional and, and, and perhaps you, 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 your point is also very right. I think that for in for in for in the specific purposes, for some purpose for a specific country and a specific place and time, we cannot generalize like that. This happened in every place, but it's true that there there are also policies that have been geared in towards um, limiting the 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 rights or the uh, or the or, or women's participation of vulnerable vulnerable groups. So, but what we were trying to say, like in general terms, is that. Inter, like international trade and international law and and sometimes even this this the design in planning of of things on how system works doesn't account to the like to actual necessities or or even biological circumstances of, of like that separates us between women and men I, I I totally agree with with your with your question but I think that uh we need to, in order to like move forward the conversation, I think we have to 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 lead the discussion into that kind of sense, or like uh, of course recognizing and acknowledging our differences, but trying to think in terms of biases on or or how like our cognitive biases lead us to think in in, in towards some way, and that's why I was saying like perhaps thinking. We have to challenge the idea that gender neutral or neutrality is 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 actually neutrality, you know? and and that that's why I, I believe that specific differences in terms of biological needs and uh, in terms of uh, I don't know uh, things that refer to our own activities. For instance, women. It's like it's two thirds of the population, like two thirds, uh, women. Uh, take children to school, for instance, and that that particular issue makes um, women's way of transportation completely different than men. For instance, I don't think that it was like completely, in, for some places, you, there are papers I've read, I've written some I've read some papers about how also roads pretend to exclude women from certain villages. But what I'm saying is that if we think in terms of the pandemic on travel disruptions, we, we think always in terms of aggregate levels. But what if we start like the disaggregating things in terms of patterns or habits or preferences or childcare services or healthcare services that women tend to perform like to a greater extent than men. And so that, so we can understand the world 
more clearly and perhaps like with having this kind of conversation like you know like it, it, sometimes it is political unfortunately for for many reasons and we we the, but the aim is to achieve more gender equity and perhaps looking at these differences in this way is my approach on how we could try to uh, equalize the the floor yes totally and there and as you said i, I think the key word that you mentioned is the bias applied to women because they are women and there are studies that take up on that but thank you very much for the question. And, and actually, because this is not a solved problem, it is why it, we need to have these spaces of, of discussion. I don't know, Laura, if we have time to continue with Padlet or you want to move forward in the presentation? Yes, I think uh, we already uh, covered uh, the time or assigned to I'm going to 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 close it here we're now going to, to the next activity this is part of the next slide please so here it's kind of more of what for you would be the relation of trade and gender and also the multilateral trading system. We want you to have this opportunity for you to write maybe in a few words, in a sentence, what is for you this activity. We all, you also can use the, the QR code and the link that will be here. So please, we are, uh, can you please put the screen for us to see maybe live results? So we are starting to, I think, in this part, one of the key issues here is that we are having these discussions about trade and gender, about the challenges. Uh, we we are seeing that the discussions at the multilateral level, what what all the initiatives that are being done in the multilateral. For example, she mentioned 25 countries that are participating in the where they are actually having desegregated data. So I think it's to, to realize that the time is now but not only multilateral, but also to do it in the national level. And how can we achieve that? I think it's with knowledge, with all the information that it's possible to gain. Um, we are seeing some words, trade and gender. I think it's really important for us to that gender inequality exists, I think, for most of us is really obvious. And the relation of trade and gender is more and more intertwined right now. And we can see it with COVID. We are seeing this part of the, the opportunities as well for women in trade. We are seeing that it is definitely a challenge for women if they don't have the same uh, opportunities because it's not about also equality. Some some will argue that neutrality is part of these uh, rules, but we can also say that, in fact, it may be not the case that even when there's inequality, women have always been in a position of not having this equality. So we have to create this equality, like some some gender responsive uh, trade policies to ha to help them achieve this equality so so i think the conversation besides also the multilateral is also in the domestic side so with this uh thank you very much for all your your inputs gender neutral might not be neutral exactly and this invisible gap that we are not seeing is actually there in some of the domestic policies. I don't know 
if any of the panelists want to say anything else, because we are now passing to the, the final conclusions. Um, I think we, are, we still have time, but if, if there is not enough, maybe we can pass to, to the final remarks here. So I'll see that, I give you the floor. Well, thank you. It was very, it, it was very interesting to see how all the input, the inputs of your ideas went through Padlet and then Slido. And some of the keywords that showed up catched my mind. Maybe they, they're not where, they were not the biggest ones, but they were important like policy. I mean, we, we have discussed how uh, policy and all stakeholders are the real ones who, who have the opportunity to make a change on all these matters. So to conclude a little bit on my, my part, <clears throat> regarding the challenge of getting more access to education technology that I have been talking about, there is evidence for a positive effect of trade induced technological change on female blue collar employment and wages. And this has been found for the case of Mexico following the entry of the NAFTA, which is now USMCA. A paper from John Ogelli and Villegas Sanchez. I am very sorry if I mispronounce their last names, but I can, if you DM me, I can send you the link. They cover how trade and technology impact gender inequality. And like what happened to NAFTA in Mexico, when firms experience larger declines in export tariffs to sell in North America, they were more likely to hire blue collar women and to pay them higher wages. This improvement in blue collar women's labor market were driven by the firms acknowledging that they needed to upgrade their technology towards to compete into a new, more com computerized production machinery market. I mean, yet we can clearly see the impact of education and technology in women as workers and how better conditions should result in a better production function. I would like to also leave open the comment that there is another barrier that we have not discussed here. Uh, the same study quoted and mentions that employers preferred hiring male directors, considering characteristics as malware, higher productivity, and higher adaptability. So in terms of gender equality, in trade there's another battle besides the one held in productive facilities and is how our male counterparts identify or see us as women. Um, an open question here could be that in another level, executive level, how many women ambassadors and members representatives are in the WTO? How many women are negotiations in trade? The number is getting higher, but we have to wonder if is there a crystal ceiling that we need to grow, to break. I'll say that this topic matters and discussions on trade and gender matter. Not for nothing, goal number five of the sustainable development goals correspond specifically to achieve gender equality, meaning substantive equality that beyond efforts of equity looks forward to remove structural barriers. In conclusion, much has changed since the 11th WTO Ministerial Conference on the Declaration of Women and Trade. And the recent created working group is a huge step. Gender does not have to wait until trade wars get resolved. This is the momentum that we need to take on too. Uh, we all have a commitment to follow and work on this ahead for the next ministerial conference. And as part of the civil society, I'm sure that all the trade tankers as, as someone baptized us, will continue to advocate for this, to advocate for a more inclusive trade and a better trade. Thank you all for the space. And thank you all for joining with your idea. Thank you, Alcida. Uh, now I will give the floor to Isadora. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Well, 
this has been for sure an interest discussion, multidisciplinary, and covering some topics that are uh, intrinsically related. So maybe let me touch on some of them. But uh, well, uh, besides this uh, final remark, I would like to also point out that, uh, well, I have been referring to um, um, non-tariff measurements mainly because, uh, well, uh, I'm focusing in the in services. But in terms of good, yes, uh, there is uh, another conversation regarding how to how to allocate this uh, lack of resources if, if we uh, reduce uh, tariffs. Well, I think this is this is a general problem, not specifically to high tariffs affecting women. Uh, high tariffs in goods still exist. They are uh, they uh, prevail in relevant sectors in some um, agriculture, um, in food, um, and they need. Well, there need to be a, a, prog a progression towards the reduction of tariffs. But uh, in this case, we are just stating that um, these, uh, well, that women are affected because they tend to still be in this, these sectors. So we need to, and maybe another opportunity, we can talk about how this, what would be the implication of high tariffs within the scope of national administration of the expenditure and so on. But in this case, I need to stress and highlight the importance of reducing the NTMs, the non-tariff measures, and in the scope of WTO. So just uh, going to quote myself, tariffs alone cannot always increase women participation in trade. Uh, we need to also to get uh, an analysis of each domestic situation in terms of cultural heritage, but one, Great step has been the establishment of actual working groups in WTO, and um, and for example, um, the importance of this of the good practices of coming to understanding frameworks would lead us to actually um, implement higher commitments. These commitments will allow us to actually, at some point, we should aim to include into these agreements provisions regarding uh, national le legislation, regarding consulting processes, regarding monitoring and evaluation. So these are variables that are to be seen in the future, but um, well, this is a long way to go, but I consider that we are in the right path. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Isadora. Uh, Vanessa. Thank you, Laura. Um, I saw a couple of words in in the paddle, in the slide, slide, like opportunities or equity. So I think that uh, it's really important that women's economy empowerment boosts productivity, increase economy diversification and income, in addition to other positive developed outcomes. These these topics are related to each other. All the changes, all the challenges that we are discussing are in are connected. So we need to resolve all of them so we can move forward. For example, increasing the female employment rates in OCDE countries to match that of Sweden could boost GDP by over six trillion US dollars. Recognizing, however, like um, as Isadora mentioned it that growth does not automatically lead to a reduction in gender-based inequality. Even as globalization has brought millions of women into paid labor, the number of women in the workforce is behind, like far behind that of men. Gender inequalities have also concentrated women at the bottom of the global value chain. In the lowest paid jobs, in peace rates, some contracted work, and increased forms of self-employment with little or no access to decent work and social protection. Women are half of the world's potential and utilization in requires access to decent, good quality pay work, as well as gender sensitive policies and regulations, such as adequate leave, uh, parental leave or flexible hours. The economies make sense too. If women play an identical role in labor markets to that of men, 
as much as 18 trillion US dollars could be added to the global annual GDP by 2025. As simple as this, when more women work, economies grow. Thank you, Laura, and thank you all for joining us uh, to the session today. Thank you. I will give the floor to Renata so you can also do the... Uh, thank you. I hope you had a great laugh about like looking at the image. Yeah. But, and uh, I think we had an amazing conversation, but you say that an image is said to be worth a, a thousand words. And this picture clearly illustrates why we need what happens when we don't disaggregate data. And well, but just to conclude, I just want to stress that gender disaggregated data data has a civilizing virtue. That's how I see it, because it provides, once again, an opportunity to understand society, reality, and or ourselves. And by just looking at the overall, there are simply things that they don't work. Or would they? No? No. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you had a, a lot of great ideas from this panel to take home and to bridge this challenges that we have presented today. And of course, uh, we can later continue the conversation because this was, as Vanessa Erogobo said, this is just the beginning of the discussion. And we, all the ideas are more than welcome for that. Thank you very much. So thank you, Renata. I think, um... I will try to summarize some of the ideas that that you presented, but I would agree. Uh, well, I would conclude as well. And and the key takeaway that I I get is that we are moving also in the right direction. Uh, as you can say, these initiatives that we couldn't discuss in so much detail right now, but there are some really good initiatives that are going there. So we just need to go at a better speed and we have to fill this existing knowledge gap of these implications. And I will say that, as Vanessa said, this is a $28 trillion issue. So we have to, to get moving for countries. Uh, I, I, I would highlight what uh, Isadora said about these issues, uh, what are the steps forward, for example, in WTO discussions, she talked about some of the government's uh, agenda that need to happen in this, in this part of, of where to include gender, etc. It's also a question that, that we are, are leaving you with, and also countries and stakeholders need to do more. We want to end with that idea that more dialogue needs to happen. And especially we need to continue incentivizing for governments, for academia, etc., to start working on data. And as my colleague said, I think we also want to do that on trade tanks. So how can you participate? I think we encourage you to make it visible for make it governments and stakeholders accountable and ask them to support this gender trade policies to subscribe these initiatives at the multilateral level and continue to incorporate in this gender trade perspective to trade which now is part of wto's work so i think i'm only left now to thank all of our panelists and Thank you very much for sticking with us in this time, even though we are we had a little uh, time frame different. But thank you again for for all of our, us of panelists and for for our audience that was really uh, good um, putting comments. We found it really interesting. We thank again the Geneva Trade Week. Uh, team for all your support always and all the the people that were in our discussions previous to this panel so we invite you to continue being in contact with trade tank and on behalf of the organizers i think there's going to be a post session survey which is going to be available on your screen or post session 
and it was a pleasure to be here with you so goodbye <laughs>